I stand before you tonight as the son of a self-made uh, Jewish businessman. Um, I'm now the uh, second generation CEO. Uh, my parents both passed away in the last year. Um, they both died with their boots on. Um, they continued to work at the company until the end. Um, my brother and sister, Renee and John, work at Edelman. Uh, my brother-in-law works at Edelman. My cousin works at Edelman. My two eldest children, Margo and Tori, work at Edelman. They joined the firm to carry on the legacy. If there are any of you in the audience out there with the name Edelman, just come see me after this speech. <laughs> we have a job for you. <laughs> see, Joel, I have one job. Yeah. Okay. All right, so tonight I'm going to talk about uh, the idea of a Jewish family business. But I'm going to do it in reverse order. And I'm going to start with business. There is a new opportunity and expectation of business, which is to operate in a manner that makes money for shareholders, but also improves society. And there are several important examples in the last couple of weeks of corporations taking the lead in societal change without waiting for government sanction. Barry, that will make you, as a right-wing person, very happy. Um, <laughs> CBS. One of America's largest drugstore chains announced on February 5th that it would ban all tobacco products in its stores. The CEO, Larry, the CEO Larry Merlop said selling tobacco is inconsistent with the purpose of the company. He accepted a loss of $2 billion in revenue from tobacco-related products. He was comfortable in the knowledge that the long-term brand equity benefit and customer royalty would more than compensate in the long run. Gap, the leading American retailer, three weeks later, decided to raise its pay level for its workers in stores above the minimum wage to $9 per hour this year and $10 an hour for next year. CEO Glenn Murphy said, I want the best workers. I can count on these colleagues to serve as customers in the caring Gap style. And a few weeks after that, Unilever, our client, the giant consumer products company, initiated Project Sunlight. It enlisted consumers in a personal way to make commitments from shorter showers to cold water laundry wash. 70 million people have signed on to do acts of goodness in six countries. There is a desire out there among the stakeholders for this move by business. And what we observe is business creating value for shareholders and state and, and society alike. This is the concept that Michael Porter from Harvard Business School introduced a couple years ago called shared value. This shift began 15 years ago, and it started with the rise of corporate philanthropy. Geniuses such as your own Bernie Marcus saw this and pioneered it in this community and elsewhere. He was one of the pioneers of corporate social responsibility. That evolved over time. Companies finding a distinctive advantage in marketing and sustainability. An example, GE's Eco-Imagination Campaign, where green equals green. The final stage, which is where we are today, is business changing its core operations in order to achieve lower costs while also attaining societal goals. Example, Walmart changing the body style of its trucks to use less energy, minimize environmental footprint, and save money for business. At Play, folks, is a dual recognition. First, in the words of Professor Subi Rangman from the NCI Business School, you cannot have a successful business in a failing society. And second, the understanding that the expectation of business has changed. Our latest Edelman Trust Barometer shows that 84% of people we survey in 27 countries believe that business can make profit while also delivering value to society. That is a big change. In sum, what we observe is a move of business, aspiration from license to operate to license to lead. Business historically has been brilliant at microeconomics, the challenges of production, delivery, marketing, pricing, finance, R&D, Business has been transactional, faithful to the laws. It's provided jobs, investment opportunities. All of this under the rubric of license to operate. 
the classic freedom to run your business in a perfect Adam Smith-like world. But today, there is a need for business to step up and do more, license to lead. Because I believe, as I'm sure many of you do, that business is our best hope, not government, to address complex global challenges. In fact, <laughs> Sheldon Nicholson wrote my remarks. <laughs> it has to, though, be business showing up differently bringing value and values to every decision. In the words, again, of our client, Paul Pullman, Unilever, it cannot just be about value. It has to also be about the S, values as well. In a secular society, which we live in, we generally don't discuss values, cultural, familial, religious, the values that we bring to the workplace that define the shapes of our businesses. But a company's culture is shaped by the actions of the individuals who work there, which is again, in turn, shaped by the values they bring to the workplace. Today at Evelyn, as Joel kindly said, we are the largest PR firm in the world, a title that my father ironically never desired, quote from him. It's great to be the biggest firm, he would tell me, but we must always strive to be the best firm. Yet paradoxically, it was my dad's insistence on a set core principles that drove us to where we are today. First, work as a team. It's we, not I. Clients are ours, not yours, not mine. Employees are partners in the family business. The relationship with the employees extends beyond the walls of the office. As an example, we give $2,000 up front to any employee who agrees with a handshake to stop smoking. We've already done this with 80 people around the world. It's my number one thing I do when I go to the office. <laughs> Second, stay entrepreneurial no matter how big you grow. Yes, it's true that we have 68 offices and 5,000 people in 27 countries, but we still think of ourselves as a small business with permission to fail as long as we're innovating and get off our butt and get up again. Case in point, we invested in digital for 10 years and made no money. And in the last four years, we've grown a $150 million business. It's a good story. Um, next, reinvest everything you make in any year into the company. If it's a good year, it's not a new car, it's an office in South Africa. That will pay off in time. <laughs> um, remain humble in spite of your success. My father wore his suits until they were shiny. He drove his Buick until the odometer surrendered. He took yellow cabs to the airport. It's a trait that we carry on as a family. I take the subway to work. You have to carry on when it gets tough. No one exemplified this better than my mother, who helped to run the business through a chronic battle with antidepressive illness for 40 years. On a personal level, being in a family business means responsibility and dedication. Many of you know this well. Dedication to the firm, in our case, meant it was part of every dinner conversation, every family vacation. Responsibility was, in fact, a value I learned the hard way when I joined the firm. I had spent two very hard years at Harvard Business School toiling to get my MBA. I was planning a vacation in Europe with a very attractive young lady as my reward before starting work in September. However, at the end of May, Ellen won a client in commodity brokerage, a subject I had covered extensively in my senior thesis in college. So I got a call from my father um, as the beginning of the exams who said I had to begin work on the Monday after the exams ended on Friday, so much for the vacation, and so much for that young lady. Oh well, I'm still a friend of hers. It took 20 years to become a friend of hers. Um, yeah. Being in a family-owned business also means a relationship of trust with your father and mother. Um, they were willing to let me, at the tender age of 26, take over a struggling New York office with 12 people to see whether I had the right stuff. Fortunately for um, us and our relationship, five years later, the New York office was the same size as the founding office in Chicago. Trust also meant that my father and I had an unspoken understanding. We had to give each other space. I started in Chicago and moved to New York. There are 733 air miles, to be precise, between Chicago and New York. I needed space. Yep, we talked every day, we had a relationship of trust, but we had very different operating styles. For all of you who have kids in your business, and I'm trying to absorb this lesson from my third generation, the kids who work with me, my, my daughters, 
You got to give them room. They're going to be different than you are. Let them do what they're going to do. They're going to fall on their face. Let them fall on their face. But you cannot, cannot put them under your thumb. Bad. Lastly, being in a family business means that we've made a very conscious decision to remain a family-owned business. As Joel said, the um, obvious play was to sell out to one of those holding companies. Well, in so doing, by staying a family business, we preserve the right to put the interests of our employees and our clients first. And customer centricity, in my view, is what makes family companies more trusted. Again, the Edelman Trust Parameter shows family companies 50% more trusted than their public company counterparts. And yet, the soul of our firm, while shaped by these principles, is actually defined most by values that you can say are essentially Jewish values. For my dad, being Jewish meant running an ethical business at any cost. Let's be clear, there are plenty of examples of unethical business people of our religion, made off, etc. But my father believed deeply that being ethical in business was the most important manifestation of his Jewish faith. I'll never forget a senior element executive telling me the story of a large foreign client ostensibly visiting my dad in Chicago to congratulate him on winning his account. In the course of the conversation, the client asked for a 5% commission for delivering the business to Edelman. My father raised his voice, stood up, got deeply red, and said, quote, get out of my office before I kick you in the pants. You have some nerve coming in here shaking me down. We're a professional firm. You insult me deeply. Further, my father believed in the ethical practice of public relations. No front organizations, no black operations spreading malicious rumors. In fact, he took on one of our large, larger competitors in those days that had gone to work for the Church of Scientology. Not every client deserves representation. I agree. I agree with you. Um, running a Jewish business, family-owned business, also means dedicating oneself to the community. My father and mother devoted time to boards such as the Lyric Opera, Art Institute of Chicago, University of Chicago. He also, though, was very much about pairing up our clients with charities. He did one of the very first between Kentucky Fried Chicken and the March of Dimes. We took on pro bono clients such as Save the Children um, after the tsunami uh, in uh, Asia. Um, he also has encouraged Edelman colleagues to volunteer in the communities. In fact, the Edelman Foundation regularly gives away several hundred thousand dollars in matching grants to people who want to serve on boards. <clears throat> We've been very active, for example, in Atlanta donating um, time to distribute 3,000 food packages for the uh, hungry with the open hand in Atlanta. But most profoundly, let me say that the most important Jewish value is the constant search for a better life and the relentless pursuit of self-improvement, because that is at the core of the Jewish experience. My paternal great-grandfather, Abraham Isaac Edelman, was a rabbi in Minsk, Russia. In 1884, he told his family, I'm taking off for the new world. Um, I'm leaving you behind. I'll send money when I can and see you in a couple of years. So two years later, having established himself in Brooklyn, he sent enough money for a steerage passage for his five people, four kids and, and, and wife, on a boat uh, that departed from Hamburg, that de stopped in Liverpool and then made it to New York City. My great-grandfather saw his children through college and the marriage and then ultimately grandchildren, my dad, and then still seeking self-improvement, asked his son for a one-way ticket to the Holy Land in 1921, and he was 82 years old. He went there and served his students with such distinction that on his gravestone, which I have seen on the Mount of Olives, the inscription reads, and his students drank wisdom from his lips. The relentless pursuit of self-improvement, exemplified by my great-grandfather, embodied by my father and mother, remains the defining influence for our firm. I tell you about the values of my Jewish family business, not just because I'm proud of them, but because I actually believe that business cannot inject value into society without being driven by a core set of values. As members of the business community, we each have a role to play in the former, but we bear accountability for the latter. My great-grandfather's kiddish cup sits right on my 
desk in my cubicle in New York. We all have cubicles. Um, it's exactly eight miles from where he settled 129 years ago. It is true that it is a religious object, but it's also a symbol of where I come from, and I think about that all the time. The story I've told tonight is the story of how business has to do more than business as usual. But in fact, what I'm talking to each of you about is your individual responsibility. Because each of us in this room has his or her own story of the persistence of our values, which are quintessential Jewish values over time. It is true that technology changes, markets change, but principles do not. And the values that are the essential force for business that wants to do better in this world cannot change. Family, community, decency, honesty, hard work. And for business to be part of the story of humanity's greatest hope, it's on business to show up differently, and it's on all of us to carry values forward. I close tonight with a quote from the book of Daniel that reminds me of my late parents <clears throat> and their lasting influence on my life. On my life. Quote, and the wise will shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who bring the multitudes to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Thank you very much.